at this time, I'm going to ask, if you have your Bible, go ahead and start turning to the book of Romans. We're going to look this morning at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I'll go ahead and tell you, Brother Fred asked if I was going to be able to get through this, or if it was going to take a couple of Sundays or a couple of weeks. I'll tell you that there is a lot here. And Lord willing, I imagine we are only going to scratch the surface today of this text. But hopefully we will see our responsibility as Christians in seeking to be made more like Christ and not like the world. So Romans 12, starting in verse 1, Paul writes, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here we have Paul giving us a statement that I imagine each of us have at least heard at some point within the scriptures. It's a very well-known passage of scripture. Because it reminds us that we are called to live in a certain way. We're called to live as a living sacrifice. We're called to not be conformed to the world and to try to fit in with everyone else. But we're called to be transformed and different. We're called to be different. Set aside or set apart. We're called to be holy. And we see that here as Paul is making this argument here. But before we get to his argument, I want to make this clear. When verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, I believe that this is because everything in the book of Romans up to this point has been building up to this section. Paul has been writing of how we as human beings are sinful by nature because of the fall. And because of this, many have been given over to a sinful wrath. Many have been given over to their own desires that are not of God. But he makes it clear that Christ has come and he justifies those. He redeems those who are his. He calls them unto salvation. And that those who are in salvation have been made just before God. And they have been made right in the eyes of the Lord. And he says, now I beseech you in a manner as to remind his audience and to remind us today that our work is not done. Just because we've been made right with God, just because we've been justified, doesn't mean we can sit around and twiddle our thumbs or just wait until the passing of time. No, he says, I beseech you. There is more to do. There is work that is to be done. In the life of each Christian, this work is a work of sanctification, a work of seeking to be set apart from sin and made more like Jesus Christ. Albert Barnes puts it this way. He says that many have affirmed that such was the tendency of the doctrines of justification by faith or election and decrees, and of the perseverance of the saints, that these would sometimes lead to licentiousness, meaning that there are some who would take the grace of God and use it as an excuse to go out into the world and live like the world. He goes on to say, after having fully stated and established these doctrines, Paul concludes that we ought to lead holy lives And on the ground of them, he exhorts people to do this very thing. So in other words, what Paul is saying is, just because we've been saved by God's grace, just because we have been given the new gift of salvation, that we have been made right with our Heavenly Father, this does not give us an excuse to go out and be like everyone else, to be like the world, to live in patterns of sin. Instead, it ought to urge us to do that which is right, to do that which we know is righteous in the eyes of God. 
But you see, there's a problem. And Paul makes that problem very evident. He gives us the solution to that problem in his very next phrase. Notice he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Paul makes it clear that we cannot live a holy life on our own. We talked about that this morning in our Bible study. We cannot be holy on our own. We cannot be righteous in and of ourselves because we have no righteousness apart from that which is Christ. We have no goodness apart from that which is of God. John chapter 15 verse 5 makes it very clear. Those of you who are in Bible study should be very familiar with this. This is one of the texts we looked at. John 15 verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me ye can do nothing notice there Jesus makes it clear apart from him we can do absolutely nothing and I believe that that goes into all of humanity both believer and unbeliever God gives us common grace and the common ability to do things only by his grace. We cannot do a single thing. I cannot take a breath apart from God. If he is out of the picture, I am non-existent. I have no power of my own. He is everything. And I can only live, and you can only live, truly if you are abiding in him. And he uses that terminology as the vine and the branches. You think about the vines that grow in this area. There's ivy all around this area. Uh, and I'll say in the driveway here at the church, I, I like the way it looks. The ivy is growing kind of on the side of the driveway. And if I was to just take a bit of that and cut it and just set it aside, that's going to die eventually. It's not going to continue to grow. If it's separated from the source of life, it ceases to grow, it ceases to bear fruit, it ceases to live. Similarly, if we are trying to live on our own, apart from the mercy and grace of God, we're not going to be doing very well. I can tell you it's not going to turn out as well as it could. We cannot do anything apart from his grace. Paul makes this clear even in the book of Romans, Romans 7, verse 18. Romans 7, verse 18, listen to what Paul says. He says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. I think we all understand on a personal level what Paul is saying here, because there are times when we want to do the right thing, but for one reason or another, things get in the way. Temptations rise up. We fall into sin. We do that which we don't want to do. Paul is, I find his writing here in chapter 7 excellent in regards to what it feels like battling the flesh every single day. You want to do the right thing. But on our own, we can't do the right thing. Only by God's grace can we do the good and the righteous that he calls us to do. Which ought to make it clear to us that if we want to live as a living sacrifice, as we're going to see in a moment, if we want to be transformed in this world and not conform to the world, it can only be done by yielding ourselves to Christ can only be done by pursuing Christ as our Lord and our King. We must yield and present ourselves to him. And this is what it tells us to do. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, those two words typically don't go together. A living sacrifice. Why? Because to be sacrificed means to die, means to be laid down, put to death. 
and to live is the opposite. Yet what Paul is saying is the very truth of the scriptures. We must live a life in which we are dying to ourselves, which we are laying aside our sinful behavior, laying aside our sinful desires, casting them off, and seeking to honor God with our very existence. Now when Paul uses the term bodies, notice he says present your bodies, a living sacrifice. I love what John Calvin says in regards to that term. He says bodies, by this he means not only our skin or bones, but the totality of which we are composed. He's meaning your entire being, your life, your your body physically, your mind, your heart, your emotion, whatever it be, we are to live for Christ. And in doing this, we must sacrifice ourselves daily. We must live offering ourselves as a gift unto the Lord, offering ourselves as a sacrifice. And that is done in many different ways, but It's simple in that we can ask the Lord, Lord, what would you have me do for your glory? In this situation, whatever it may be, you can ask, God, how can I glorify you? How can I lift you up? How can I make you known in this situation? How can I live for your glory and not my own? The Old Testament writer Micah He gives us an example that the Lord desires us to be a sacrifice. And he gives us an excellent example of what that looks like. Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, we see this. The question is asked, Wherewith or where shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? The questions that's being asked here, the questions that are being asked here are very pertinent. Saying, how can I best worship God? Does God want me to give a burnt offering of a calf? And, And this, of course, is probably difficult for us to fully grasp because we're not so familiar with the Old Testament sacrificial system as they would have been. We don't sacrifice animals to the Lord any longer. We know that Christ has taken the place of all of the sacrifices. He has made a sacrifice once and for all. And it was good enough that we don't have to sacrifice animals any longer. But at this time, they were still under that system. And Micah's asking, will God be pleased with, if I gave a thousand rams, or if I poured out oil as an offering so much that created a river, is this what God desires? Should I even give my own child? What does God desire in worship? Verse 8, he hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? In other words, the answer here is given in that the Lord desires that our lives be a sacrifice, that we live justly. That is a sacrifice unto the Lord. That is a form of worship to the Lord, that we are merciful That is a worship unto the Lord. That we are humble. That is a worship unto the Lord. You see, when we do these things and things of the like, when we live a life that is walking in line with the scriptures, when we live a life where we are humble and merciful and loving to others, and we pursue just and right things, This is an act of worship to the Lord. Colossians 3.17 tells us this. 
that in whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. When you go out and about at your workplace, or when you go out grocery shopping, when you go out maybe to the movies, whatever it may be, all things ought to be done in a way that is glorifying to God. And that's not always easy for us to comprehend how this is done. It's not always easy for us to understand how this is accomplished. But I tell you, when we begin to be conscious of the things that we do, and we begin to be very aware that we are called to live for his glory in all things, then we are going to start asking ourselves, is what I'm doing pleasing to God? Is what I'm doing in this moment right here and now pleasing to the Lord? Is my reaction to whatever this situation was pleasing to God? When we begin asking ourselves questions like this, I believe we will begin to truly be able to start worshiping the Lord in all areas of our lives. And going back, of course, to Romans 12, verse 1, we see, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And he uses this phrase, he says, which is your reasonable service. Those two terms, reasonable service, depending on the, the translation you're using this morning, some of your translations may say, and this is your worship. Or this is your logical service unto the Lord. And ultimately that's what it means. It, it comes from the term logos, reasonable, logical. It's the thing that is most making sense at the time. And service, of course, is in reference to worship. That when we lay our lives down and say, Lord, I want you to be everything in my life. I want my life to be a living sacrifice. I want everything I say, do, think to be glorifying to you. I want the very life I live to be an offering unto you that when we begin to do this very thing, it is worship. It is worship. Far too often, and I, I'll tell you myself, I'm guilty of this as well, that I sometimes limit worship to the Sunday morning service. When I hear the term worship, I think of a time in which we come together. Now that is true. We are worshiping here today our Lord Jesus Christ. But worship is not just one hour a week. Worship is not just a time on Sunday morning. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is a constant thing that is to be lived out day after day when you are with others, when you're by yourself, when you're at work, when you're at home. Worship can occur in living for Christ, uplifting him in all things. Now it's here that we must understand verse 2 comes into play. Romans 12, verse 2. He says, And... Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed, but be transformed. It's interesting because when I think of the terms used here, conform and transform, notice they are very similar. They use form in English. But they are very different when it comes to the Greek. The term conform comes from a Greek word meaning, of course, to fashion yourself like any other. Meaning to imitate someone else or to look like something else. If we are conformed to the world, it means that we look like the world, that we act like the world, that we live like the world. But that is, of course, the opposite of the desire of God. He tells us, do not conform yourself to this world, meaning don't just live like everybody else. 
Don't just walk like everybody else. Don't talk like everybody else. Don't think like everybody else. But be different. First John verse, excuse me, First John chapter two, verses fifteen through sixteen. Listen to what John writes. He says in verse fifteen, "Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of." the world. Now when he says love not the world, we need to understand, of course, this is worldliness, sinfulness. Don't love sin. Don't love things that are offensive to the Lord. For to do so would be conforming to sin. We're not called to live this way. We're called to live a life that is transformed. And that term, transform, comes from the Greek word metamorpho and I know those of you out there who perhaps have been around for some time you may have taken a class at a young age I remember myself taking classes in elementary school where we learned about how butterflies come to be they are born or essentially hatched I guess and they come into this life as caterpillars. And then those caterpillars eat, and they eat, and they eat. And then finally they grow to a point where they begin to crawl upwards and go into either a cocoon or a chrysalis. They go into the shell, and it hardens. And after some period of time, they come out, and they're no longer a caterpillar. They're a butterfly. They are a different creature altogether and this is the term where we get that terminology metamorphosis it's that scientific term where something changes completely to another thing this is what paul is saying here that we are not to conform ourselves to the world but we're to be changed completely we're not to look like the world whatsoever we are to be different and how do we do this he goes on to tell us that this is done by the renewing of our mind. Now that has always been something of interest to me. How do you transform by the renewing of your mind? And it's here that I believe we must look to the reality that we must think differently than the world. Our mind cannot be thinking the same things. We cannot have the same end goals as the world. There are those in this world who it's all about leaving something for their children. And I think that's a good goal. But for many people, that's the entirety of their life is they just want to leave something behind. For us, we can leave something behind. There's nothing wrong in that. But we must think heavenward, not just about the earth. We must think about our citizenship in heaven. We must think about casting off the old man. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 tells us this clearly. Paul goes in to speaking of the old man. It says, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, and true holiness. I think about this even going back to that transformation like the butterfly that was once a caterpillar. They put off the old. They put on the new. We are to put off the old man. The old man is simply a term used to remind us of sinfulness or the flesh. That which is not pleasing to God. We're to cast that aside. We're to seek to rid ourselves of it. And to put on the new man, meaning put on the spirit of God. Put on godly attributes and righteousness from Christ. And in doing this, in seeking to cast our sin aside and to do that which we know Christ calls us to do, to live a life that is pleasing to God, we will be able to begin renewing our minds. 
And this is a process. It's not going to happen overnight. I think we far too often, we get in the mindset that because we live in such a day and age where things are now, if I go, I could go on right now on my phone or on my tablet and just order something. And if I pay a little extra, it could probably be here within the next few hours. We are so used to now, 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 but sanctification takes time. And this process is going to take time. We're not just going to immediately be able to cast off everything that is wrong and put on the new man. It's going to take time. But the more we do it, the better we will become at doing so. And as Matthew Henry puts it, he says that this progress of sanctification or dying to sin more and more and living to righteousness more and more is the carrying on of this renewing work if we want to be made new if we want to be transformed and not conform to the world we must constantly be seeking to be made more like christ and i tell you what better way to do that than following paul's advice or command in philippians 4 verse 8 Paul in Philippians 4 verse 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. If you want to renew your mind, think of those things which are true. Think of those things which are honest and just and pure. I could go through this list in verse 8 of Philippians 4 and I could replace each and every single one of those words with the same word. Whatsoever things are true, I could say, well, what is true? Christ. He is the truth. What is honest? Christ is the epitome of honesty. What is just? The Holy One, Christ. If we want to be made more like God, Christ must be on our minds and on our hearts. We must be thinking of ways to honor him in our lives. And in doing this, I believe we will continue to be made more like him. We will be sanctified day after day. And this does something very beautiful. Because at the end of Romans 12, verse 2, it tells us this. I'll read through verse 2 in its entirety. But be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. When we begin to live a life where we trust in His goodness and His wisdom, His righteousness, and lean not on our own understanding, when we begin to live a life where we are seeking to honor him in every action, every word, every thought, we will begin to prove his perfect will. And what is the will of God for his people? That's a question that is vast. But I'm going to try and answer it this morning with one scripture. What is God's will for you? Each and every one of us has a different path. Each and every one of us has a different road, if you will, or a different street. We're all going to the same place, but God leads us there and, and has us do different things. He wants different things from each of us, but there is one thing he wants from all of us, and it is found in Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. What we see here is that he wants each and every one of us to do one thing. We are to be conformed, not to the world, but to Jesus Christ. He called us, he predestinated us to do this very thing, to imitate Christ, to emulate 
everything that he has done, to seek to be like him because he is perfection. He is righteousness. He is good. He is holy. He is pure. The will of God, I don't know the specifics for each and every one of you, but I do know the very general. He wants you and I and all of his children to be like his son, to love like his son, to care like his son, to walk in righteousness like his son, to avoid sinfulness like his son. Brothers and sisters, if we want to be a living sacrifice, if we want to be transformed and not conformed to the world but conformed to Christ, we must live day after day seeking to do that which we know is right. Seeking to walk as he walked. And I know it's not easy. I'm not going to try and convince you. It's the easiest thing you'll ever do. I don't even go as far as to say it's probably the opposite. It's one of the hardest things that there is to do. Is to walk as Christ walked. Why? Because the world doesn't want Christ. The world doesn't want anyone to imitate Christ. The world hates Christ. And anything to do with him. That's where we were before we knew Christ. We were in that same boat. We didn't want to be holy. We didn't want to walk in goodness. We wanted to be selfish. We wanted to focus on me and just my desires. But if we want to do what Christ has called us to do, we have to focus on him above all else. We have to, as those great two commandments say, love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. We must do this. And in doing so, I believe we will fulfill this scripture that we will live a sacrificial life. Not living for ourselves, but living for the glory of the living God. This is his desire for us. I pray that we take it seriously.